This episode is presented by Simply Safe. More on that later. Today we're going to be building this giant L-shaped desk. Well, this is just the base that the cabinet that the desk sits on top of is going to go on. So there's going to be the base and then the cabinet, then the top, then there's going to be another corner leg here, and then one more leg over there. And actually, you know what? We'll cover everything in the video, so why don't we just get to that? All right, so this is a pretty big desk, which means it used a lot of wood, and wood is pretty expensive right now, especially walnut, which means that it costs a lot of money. So because of that, we paid extra attention to making sure that we use the wood as efficiently as possible. So the first several hours of this project basically just consisted of going through all of our boards and figuring out where we'd use each piece, and then milling everything up. And it took us a long time to mill everything, as you can tell by the movement of the sun along our back wall in this shot. All that said, while the desk itself is big, it's not really that complicated and really just consists of three main components. The legs, the cabinet, and above all else, the top. So the top is going to be a big L shape that's 88 inches along this edge and 100 inches along this edge and then 30 inches wide. And that's a pretty hefty L. We're talking like a Helvetica extra black L here. Anyway, so after milling everything to just about an inch thick, we could start putting our two big panels together. So back when we milled everything, you might have noticed that we never jointed the faces of our boards. We just went right over to the planer. And the reason for this was that our joiner's only eight inches wide, and in order to make our tops out of the material that we had, our finished boards needed to be wider than that. In total, we used seven boards for the top. So each of the two panels consists of three full boards, and then half of one of the boards that we ripped on the bandsaw prior to milling. So because these boards were so long and too wide to joint, as you can see in this shot, when making our panels, some of them were pretty wonky. So for us, that work run was basically just a crap ton of dominoes. That said, dowels or whatever other mechanical reinforcement you like would also work. And what this is going to do is force the panel of the boards to be coplanar. And then due to the way that it's designed, the legs in the box will essentially act like giant calls and it'll hold everything nice and flat. So in other words, we're kind of just using brute force to give us the outcome that you'd normally get from proper milling. And in this shot, you can see our glued up panels consisting of three and a half boards, which are still oversized in terms of width and length for now. So we're gonna let those dry and we can start working on the legs. So here I've got some eight quarter material and the first thing that I'm gonna do is cut it into some oversized chunks that'll eventually yield our leg pieces. And in this shot, you can see that I'm using some templates to help me size things. So anytime I'm making shapes like this that have these kind of curved transitions and more organic shapes, using templates is my preferred method. And probably the easiest way to produce templates is by using a CNC if you have one, like you see me doing on the X carve in this shot. That said, you don't need to have a CNC to make templates. In fact, last month I made this coffee table that utilized templates, which I made by hand using a paper printout. And if you want more detail on that workflow, you can watch that video, but I'm also gonna put a link to a video in the description where Sean laid everything out really nicely about how to make templates. But regardless of how you get there, at this point we've got a bunch of leg blank pieces all cut and milled to a uniform thickness, which for me was about an inch and three quarters. And next I'm going to use my joiner to establish one nice flat edge on each piece. So whenever we had milled our pieces about a minute ago, we ended up erasing the marks that we had initially drawn on, which is actually a good thing. So next I'm going to remark the template shapes onto my pieces, only this time they actually represent where the final piece will be cut out. Then with all 12 pieces marked, four pieces for each of the three legs, I'm gonna put them into groups the way that I think that they're gonna look best and label them to help me keep everything in order. So from there, we can head back over to the bandsaw and just cut on the outside edge of our marker line. 
except for in the transition curve areas. You can see that I'm going a little extra wide here and leaving a little bit more material, which we can refine later. Okay, so being the good thinker, a header that I am, I guess, way back when I was designing the templates, I did a few things to help make my life a little bit easier. So first was that I made the joint faces parallel with the front and back edges of the entire assembly, which means that I can use the table saw to rip the pieces and get the perfect angle. Next, I also made it so that both of these pieces are equally thick at the transition area, which means that I can lock my fence down one time based off of my template and then cut all six of these pieces at the same time. And the last kind of planning ahead thing that I did was I designed these joint faces both at 90 degrees, which meant that I could cut them both on my crosscut sled. And that means that the only two sort of tricky joint faces to cut are these, both of which are essentially just 10 degree angles going in opposite directions. So technically you could cut these on a miter saw if you have one that's dialed in nicely. I don't though, and personally I feel that I get a more accurate result using a table saw. Anyway, and the way that I do this is by using a temporary plywood sled. So this is a sled that I've probably used on, I don't know, like five other projects, and I'll just keep using it until it's too small to be useful anymore. So with that done, I can put my template in position with the joint face perfectly flush along the cut edge of the sled, and then I can set up two fences. One of them is going to hold the piece at the proper angle and the other one's going to act as a stop so that my pieces all come out to the same length. Then I can cut the joint faces on all three of my work pieces and I know that they're going to be identical to one another as well as identical to the template obviously. So with the first three joint faces cut Next, I can adjust my sled and cut the remaining joint faces. And again, I'll cut all of those three at the same time so they're identical. So at this point, the pieces are looking good at the joint faces as well as along their outside edges. Instead, we still need to do a ton of work on the inside shape and the ends of the vertical pieces, but first we're going to just glue them up and then we can continue to refine things after they dry. So to assemble again here, I'm going to use some dominoes, but dowels or beadlock tenons or really anything that you have access to would work just as well. And because we're going to be caking on the glue pretty heavily here, I like to throw a couple of these Rockler project mats down on my table. Helps to keep things clean and actually it's kind of fun to pick off the dried glue afterwards. So as it turns out, the first day of work on the cabinet's pretty redundant to what we've already done. So I'm not going to go over it in detail. It was basically more just breaking down wood, milling, and then gluing up into oversized panels. So now that we've sufficiently glossed over that, let's pick up where our panels are dry, rough sanded, and ready to become a box. So the only sort of extra, I guess, preparation that we had to do when making these panels versus making our desktop panels was paying attention to the orientation of our boards. Basically the top and the two sides come from three boards where we made sure that the grain would flow up the left side of the left panel, across the top, and then down the right side of the right panel. Now, a lot of this might be overkill since the cabinet's gonna be sitting under a desk, but whatever, it's good practice to stay in and you never know. Maybe someday somebody will notice it. But in any case, we're gonna go ahead and cut miters on all eight ends of the four boards, and then we can rip everything to its finished width.
All right, in this shot, we've got the top and bottom panels back to back with their inside faces up. And we're gonna clamp them together so that we can cut a dado in that's gonna hold our vertical partition. So to do that, we've clamped a piece of scrap plywood that has a straight edge across the width of both panels, and then used a flush trim bit with a half inch diameter to ride along the plywood, which will cut the dado. And we're using a plunging base on the router here so that we can stop the cut about two inches shy of the front edge of the panels. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but because things are getting kind of technical now, this is probably a good time to answer a question that I know we're gonna get asked. And the short answer is, no, there's not gonna be plans for this particular desk. And I know you didn't ask for it, but here's the long reason. So the main reason that we're building this piece was for a custom order for a client named Charles. Whereas when we make plans, the pieces are specifically designed to become a plan. And because it takes about 300 man hours to produce one set of plans, it's not really realistic to make plans for every piece. Plus we already have a desk that we did a set of plans for, the desk wire. And while I know taste is subjective and they certainly look different, I think that both cater to the same kind of sensibilities, which is to say, if you like one, you'll probably like the other. And finally, this desk is gigantic. So I just don't think that there'd be enough people out there interested in building it for themselves to justify a plan. Plus, if you were absolutely hell-bent on having an L-shaped desk, you could pretty easily take the information in DeskWire and turn it from something like this to something like this. So if you want to build a desk or a chair or a coffee table or a dining table or a... You get the point. Check out the plans and I'll have a link in the description. Okay, so while I was rambling about plans there, Sean had cut a rabbit along the back edge of all four panels and attached a piece of hardwood to the front edge of a piece of walnut vineyard plywood that's going to become the vertical partition. Then after cutting in some dominoes, we could glue the whole thing together. So while this is in clamps, next we could fit in the partition. And as you'll recall, the dado for the partition is half of an inch wide, but the partition itself is three quarters of an inch wide. So first we cut a pair of roughly eighth inch deep shoulders. Then after doing that, we could trim off the front couple inches of the shoulder and install the partition. All right, while Sean was taking care of the cabinet, I continued working on the legs to refine and finish the shape. So the first step here was to use some double-sided tape to attach all four template pieces to our legs. Then I'll use a flush trim bit to work my way around the entire inside perimeter, flush trimming my work pieces to my template. Except for in the transition areas where I kind of float away a little bit. And we're gonna take care of this last little bit of material in a minute by sanding. So I'm basically just working my way down. Then when there's just a little ledge left, I'll switch from a bit where the bearing is at the base to one where the bearing is at the tip. And I just realized that I'd been referring to this as a flush trim bit before, but this is a templating bit and this is a flush trim bit. So apologies for the confusion. And anyway, you can do this by hand or on a router table but once you switch, you have to remove the last little bit of material in one pass, which is why I like to work my way down pretty much as far as I can go before switching. Now, since I still had two more legs that I had to do this exact same thing on, I decided to do a little experiment and cut the other two on the X-Carve Pro. Also, every time we do a project that uses templates, one of the most common questions that we get is something along the lines of, why don't you just cut out the entire piece on the X-Carve? And we actually made a video about that roughly a year ago, which I can link in the description. I did this one manual and I thought, hey, why do two more manual when I can race against the machine? So I kept track of how long it took me to make this. I'm not gonna tell you, but I will reveal it in the video. Oh, hey, you caught me drawing. So while I do that, let's take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Simply Safe, who, by the way, right now are offering their holiday deals of 40% off or more. So there's never been a better time to put a system together. So if you've never heard of Simply Safe, first, 
I don't believe you. But they make home security systems that are easy to set up, intuitive to use, and that make sure your home is safe by covering your home both inside and out thanks to products like their video doorbell, glass break sensors, and everything else that they offer. So here's how it works. After you design your system, it gets delivered right to your door and it's really easy to set up yourself. And from there, your home's being professionally monitored 24 seven. And if anything happens, they're always on team will call authorities immediately. And Simply Safe's interactive monitoring service begins at only 50 cents per day. We've had our system for over two years now, starting off with window and door sensors, glass break sensors, cameras, and the basics, and have since expanded to include the video doorbell and most recently their new wireless outdoor security camera. And this thing's slick, super easy to install, has a huge 140 degree field of view, plus eight times zoom and a built-in spotlight with color night vision and two-way audio so you can communicate through it and keep an eye on everything around the clock. So if you've been thinking about getting a home security system, or even if you have a system that you think could be better, you owe it to yourself to give Simply Safe a look. There's no contract and no hidden fees, and right now you can save 40% or more during their holiday sale. Just visit simplysafe.com slash four eyes to learn more. All right, thanks, Simply Safe. Also, I'm done drawing this desk now, and I don't think I really like it, but I'm halfway through building it, so I guess let's finish it off. Okay, so with all three of my legs cut now, next we can clean up that little transition bit on the inside corners. So like I mentioned before, I left this transition proud back when I was template routing. And on the CNC legs, I also left a little flat spot so that I could do the final shaping by sanding. So to take care of this, it's pretty quick. And because there's nothing technical happening here, it's not crucial that all of these be perfectly identical. You really just want a nice look and a nice transition. So I know it's very small, but in this shot, you can see the difference between what the seam looks like coming off of the sander versus coming off of a router, where you get these little tiny bits of chip out. Again, it's very mild, but it's just slightly cleaner, so I like to do it that way. Okay. Next, we're gonna grab our plywood sled again and establish a new cut edge. So now this thing's a 32nd of an inch closer to its eventual death. And this time we're basically just making a giant cross cut sled that we can use to lop off the parts of our leg verticals that extend up past the top of the horizontal pieces. So after making this cut on all three legs, Technically, we could flip the legs over or rotate them 180 degrees and do the same thing on the parts that extend past the bottom, but we're not. Instead, what we're gonna do is set our table saw's fence to whatever the maximum height of our table is supposed to be minus the thickness of our top. All right, so in reality, the next thing that we did was start working on the joinery for how the legs and the top are gonna attach but I'm actually gonna come back and talk about all of the joinery at the same time a little bit later. So now we're gonna jump around in time a little bit. And the next and final thing that we have to do to our legs is add in a couple of profile details. Namely, we're gonna add a chamfer to the inside perimeter of our leg faces all the way around. And then we're gonna add what we always call a thumbnail profile to the front edge of the legs. And this is a profile where you get a nice combination of a rounded edge while maintaining a really crisp line. And if you want more technical information on how to make this and see our other favorite edge details, I'm going to link a video in the description where we cover it way more thoroughly than we can in this video. When we last saw the top, it had been glued up into oversized panels. So here we are with it good and dry and doing some very rough sanding just basically removing any extra glue and fixing any areas where the boards might not be coplanar. From there, Sean's gonna use a track saw to make a miter cut on the inside corner of each of the top pieces and then cut them to their finished length by making a 90 degree cut. So by the time he had finished doing that, the top's looking like this, where the length of each piece is dialed in, but they're still overly wide and you'll see why we did that in a minute. But before we do anything else, we need to join the tops in an L. Now for the purposes of transporting this thing and getting it into a house, we needed to make the entire desk be able to break apart into sections. So not only individual legs and the cabinet, but even the top needed to break apart. 
So in order to do that, we use this Domino Connect hardware, which isn't hard to use, but it's one of those things that you do just infrequently enough that you basically need to relearn how to do it every time. Now, I know that it looks a little rough in this shot, but the top still needs a lot of sanding and cleanup, so it's gonna look better when it's done, I hope. But anyway, as I said before, the top is still too wide, and that's because we're gonna be cutting this inside radius. So in this shot, Sean's marked a line that's 30 inches away from the back edge, and we can rip most of the way across the length and stop just a little bit before we get to where it would curve. And technically, you could do this on a table saw, but it's a pretty heavy piece and I think Sean doesn't like to ask for help. That said, what is definitely a one-man operation is finishing off the curve. So to do that, we made ourselves a little inside radius piece, but anyway, cutting this was kind of a giant version of what we did on the legs, so just more good old-fashioned template routing. So with that all looking good, next we can fill up any knot holes with some black epoxy and let those set up. Okay, so when we last saw the cabinet, we had glued it up into a box and added a vertical partition. So in the cabinet, we're going to have three drawers and one door. For the drawer boxes, this is something that we've covered a bunch of times, and we have a dedicated video on Sean's channel that gets into all the technical stuff. So I'm going to link that video if you want to know more about drawer boxes. That way we don't have to talk about it again here. But the one tip that I will give is if you use Bloom drawer slides, Blum, Bloom, like we do, seriously get this jig from Rockler. I don't like telling people that you have to have something because obviously you don't, but this thing makes it so much easier and honestly it's cheap. So this is as close to a must have declaration as I'm ever going to make. All that said, jumping back into this project specifically, the only sort of special thing that we paid attention to for the drawers and doors was the grain on the fronts. So for the drawers, the way that we did this was by gluing together one panel that's essentially as big as the opening, and then cutting that into our individual drawer faces, as opposed to what might be the more kind of obvious way that you would think to do it, which would be cutting each drawer front from a board. So what that does is you end up where the only place where the grain transitions is right in the middle of our middle drawer front, rather than here and here, where we also have the gaps between our drawer faces. And you can argue which is more discreet, but to me, this is what looks the best. And I guess it kind of depends on the wood you're using. All right, then the only other thing that we needed to do to our cabinet was build in the toe kick base thing. So thankfully to build this, I was able to use off cuts from the actual cabinet. And pretty much all I did was build a really shallow box using miters. And I sized it so that it's four inches shorter than the cabinet and two inches shallower. And to assemble it, I wanted to use the fastest approach possible. So for the four exterior pieces, I used some tape to hold everything together and then reinforced each corner with a little block on the inside. Then to add two more stretchers, I just cut a pair of pocket holes on each end and screwed it all together. Now I've got comments in the past from people telling me that pocket holes have no business being in higher end furniture, which I guess this piece arguably is. And I have to say that I 100% disagree. There are times where I think that it's as good or even better than other solutions like dominoes or dowels. But if you like making your life harder, that's fine by me. And actually on that note, I know that this project that we're building is pretty advanced, I guess, but that we're still going over a lot of the things that are a little more basic. 
And that's because I know that a lot of people who watch these videos are newer to woodworking. It's not like I'm talking to a bunch of Norm Abramses. Or Ambry. Whatever the plural of Norm is. Anyway, all of that is to say, if you are newer to woodworking and mostly watch these videos for entertainment or inspiration, but maybe you want something that's a little more tailored towards expanding your current skill set, go check out the Craig Academy. I personally worked on it with them, so I can vouch for it. I built three of the six projects that they cover, a workbench, a shoe bench, and a coffee table, or as I like to call it, a coffee bench. And in addition to the projects, they've got a whole skills library and way more than I can talk about here. But the bottom line is it's tailor-made for people who are newer to woodworking and looking to take their skills to the next level. So I'll put a link in the description. And if you do sign up, just tell them that I sent you. All right, so at this point, all of our components are made and we're ready to assemble. So here we're gonna be bouncing around in time a bit to talk about how everything came together. And we're gonna start with the legs. Initially, I had thought that I would cut a bevel to join the two legs together, but the more that I thought about it, that seemed kind of overly complex. So instead, I used my trusty old sled to rip an amount of material off the back of one of the legs that was equal to the thickness of the other leg. And what this is going to do is make it so that from the inside corner, which is the only visible corner of the leg, this area right here will appear equally thick on both faces. So basically the same thing as if I had mitered it. To attach the legs to the top in a removable way, we're going to use some threaded inserts and some oversized holes to allow for the top to expand and contract while still having a nice connection. So to cut those in, we're going to start by drilling a small pilot hole in the top of our legs. And the reason that I'm using a portable drill press is because I want to keep this pilot hole as straight as possible. And because these legs are three and a half inches wide right here, it's not going to be able to reach all the way through. So after making the first pass, I'm going to drill deeper without using the drill press. Then I'm going to have to switch to a longer bit that can reach all the way through. And then from there, I'm going to have to put in an even wider bit. And with this one, I'll start by drilling up partway through the underside and then going from the top to meet where the first cut was. That way I don't get any blowout on either side. And what all this is going to do is give me an oversized hole that a bolt coupled with a washer can fit in and wiggle around, but that it won't fall through. So with all that done, I'm going to use this little template that I always keep around to cut a mortise on the underside of the leg that all the hardware can sit in. And this is going to do two things. First, it'll make it so that the hardware is invisible unless you're lying underneath the desk. And second, by making this mortise about an inch and a quarter deep, it'll make it so that our three inch bolts will extend three quarters of an inch beyond the top of the leg and eventually into the underside of the top. So in total, I'm gonna cut four attachment points like this onto our two legs. Two here, and then two more here. Attaching the cabinet to the top is similar, but slightly trickier. Basically, it would look weird if the cabinet was attached directly to the top. So instead, there's this sort of intermediary piece that bridges the gap, which I made out of some of the leftover leg material. So for this one, I'm going to clamp the connector piece on top of the cabinet position where we want it to eventually be attached. And then I drilled a small pilot hole that went through the top side and down into the cabinet, extending all the way through the inside of the cabinet. Then again, I'm going to drill an oversized hole through the cabinet, just like we did with the legs, and then use a router to mortise out the hole that the washer and bolt can tuck up into. For the threaded inserts themselves, I could use that pilot hole that I had initially drilled through the connector piece, just enlarging it and drilling slightly deeper than three quarters of an inch. Then we're going to use some dominoes and glue to permanently attach this piece to the underside of the top. For the legs though, we don't really have a pilot hole that we can reference. So instead, with the desktop connected and flipped upside down, we're going to need to just kind of position our legs where we want them, make a mark through the holes for the bolts, and then install the threaded inserts there. All right, while we're putting the finishing touches on this one, I'd like to invite you once more to check out our woodworking plans. Whether you're looking to build a desk, a coffee table, a dining table, a dresser, 
a different coffee table, a different dresser, a rocking chair, a dining chair, a lounge chair, a smaller dining table, or a whatever this thing is, we've got something for you. And as for this desk, while it won't be a plan, if you want to take inspiration from it and build something, that's awesome. I say, go for it. Personally speaking, I think that Sean and I would both agree that this was a fun change of pace. You know, it's not often that we get to build something of this scale. And going in, while it can feel pretty daunting, at the end of the day, I'm pretty pleased with the outcome. So maybe instead of continuing to describe it as a big L, I'll call it a big W. Special thanks to all of my Patreon members for helping me to make these videos possible. I know I say it in practically every video, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's true. So, thank you. Seriously. I couldn't do it without you. And if you're liking these videos and want to find out more about how you can support the show, get a 4 Eyes t-shirt, a Field Notes booklet, and even discounts on our plans, check out the link in the description. And, as always, no pressure. Alright, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.